the webinar. We are back for 2022. Uh, my name is Sarah Snavel. I am a certified professional ergonomist. I'm one of the co-owners of Pro Ergonomics. Um, and uh, yeah, we're here to do what we do webinars. I want to say we do monthly webinars. We missed January of 2022 though, uh, and we're back on track now. Um, so we've got February happening, which is uh, today in particular, I chose this day because it is RSI Awareness Day, an international day for raising awareness to repetitive strain injuries, also known as musculoskeletal disorders or MSDs. And so it's a great day just to talk about how we might make staff at our workplace more aware of MSDs. Um, and how we might make them more aware of ergonomics, right? And the types of injuries that we're trying to prevent. Um, and so for today, I really wanted to focus on tips to make ergonomics training more practical and engaging. So I'm gonna talk about this ergonomics, I'll call it like ergonomics awareness or ergonomics 101, um, where we talk about like, you know, what is ergonomics and, and sort of what are the injuries that it causes. So some of that stuff can be not necessarily the most exciting. There's definitely parts about ergonomics. You know, we do hands on training, work method training, and um, that stuff is quote unquote easy to make engaging. Uh, but you could probably apply some of these training tips to, you know, any type of um, training, right? You know, when you're delivering health and safety type training, there's so much stuff that we want people to know, but they need to know a lot of stuff. <laughs> so, how do we make it different? How do we make it practical? And so that's what I want to talk about today um, is sort of how I how how I do, but how we at Pro Ergonomics um, put together training. So, you know, you're thinking about goals and objectives. What is it that we want people to learn? What is it that they need to learn and need to know? And so what is that content? And then in terms of delivery, thinking outside the box, how can we make it different? How can we make it practical, engaging? In a world where there is so much training, um, how can we make it stand up or sorry, stand out? So before you take on any type of training initiative, you know, you're thinking about what are you trying to achieve? Uh, what is it that you want staff to get out of the training and the why? <laughs> um, your first thought is that you want to provide them. Maybe again, I'm going to focus on this general knowledge on ergonomics. So they need to know what is ergonomics, some of the basic ergonomic principles, uh, how ergonomics might apply to them to be safer in the work that they're doing. And then, you know, know that it's a branch within health and safety. We are looking at hazards that uh, sometimes aren't as obvious. You know, we're not we're not looking at hazards like cutting yourself or falling from a ladder or slips, trips and falls. Um, you know, we're we're talking about these chronic wear and tear injuries that sort of creep up on you. They sort of sneak up on you. Um, maybe you're wanting to draw attention to a new or an updated policy or reporting tools on um, on uh, strains and sprains. Uh, maybe a new initiative that the company is taking on related to ergonomics. Maybe your joint health and safety committee is going to have a new focus on ergonomics or you're forming an ergonomics committee. There would be all types of things that you, you know, you might want to be getting across. Um, when it comes to this ergonomics awareness training, I will say that it is, it's sort of like the core or the, the foundation, right, of, of any type of injury prevention program. You kind of work backwards a little bit if you think about, um, Okay, so the Ministry of Labor is a good example where they'll run blitzes or they'll come in and do inspections, um, you know, maybe ergonomics related, or maybe they're there for something else. Um, but you can sort of build your program based on, you know, almost like an audit of what they would be looking for. So when they write an order and it's related to ergonomics, it's often related to uh, one, putting in some sort of a, a program or a policy, right? We, we see a lot of um, orders related to needing to have that in place. You, know, you need to have your ducks in a row with respect to your paperwork and your policies and um, making sure that you have that sort of commitment in place on what you're actually going to uh, try to prevent in the workplace. Um, they also will write orders if they see something that looks hazardous. So from an ergonomics perspective, um, they don't always tell you how to fix it, but they'll state that you need to have an ergonomic risk assessment done by a qualified individual. That's a pretty standard phrase. So you'll need to identify the hazards, um, kind of rank them or rate them to see the level of severity and then address them. 
Um, but the third component is having orders related to training, so education and training related to ergonomics. And they'll sort of branch that into one is that they need to know about the program or two about a specific risk assessment that's been done. And now, you know, we need to have more training on how to use this or how to do this. Um, and those are probably the most common that we see. You can probably group all Ministry of Labor orders related to ergonomics into those three categories. Right, so maybe you've gotten an order from the Ministry of Labor and you need to do training. Hopefully you're being a little bit more proactive um, and you're putting in the training in place before leading to it being, you know, an order or something of that nature. Um, and then, you know, your training could be more targeted. Maybe it's where you're going to be focusing on some very specific tasks that your frontline staff do, and you're going to educate them on ideal work methods. I'd almost call that like a phase two, like phase one is this ergonomics awareness. So what is ergonomics and and some of the general um, hazards and the types of injuries that it works to prevent? And then the phase two is like the how does it apply to me and how can we how can I make it more specific to what I do? Right. So all of those are valid reasons and they'll give you some direction in your planning and your training because it's going to probably look a little bit different for each of you. I know we have um, lots of people on today from lots of different industries. And I mean, even if you think about your own organization within it, there's probably like little sub industries, right? You know, like I'm uh, I was just talking about this you know, for a hospital, actually. So a hospital is a good example where, you know, you've got lots of different little subgroups of these uh, of frontline staff. So you have frontline staff who are doing like your clinical and your nursing and you have the frontline staff would also be, you know, in the pharmacy or in the labs, um, the housekeeping, the support services who are transporting patients, the maintenance, food services, right? These are all very different groups. Um, so depending on um, your industry, uh, also depending on your current state of your ergonomics awareness in your organization. Um, so maybe you're starting from scratch. Maybe you've already, you know, maybe you've had your program going for a little bit and you're a little bit more advanced in your ergonomic initiatives. Um, it's just about thinking about what you're trying to achieve and sort of breaking it down into more manageable chunks. So maybe you want to do all of the above, right? And so maybe one session isn't exactly what you need. You almost need like a rollout plan of how you're going to break down all of those topics. But I want to spend a little bit of time focusing on um, sort of like, again, helping you to break it down, right? So thinking about who your frontline staff are. So you again, you might have several different groups or types of frontline staff at your company. So take into consideration how you might effectively deliver ergonomics training or just training in general to engage them. Can you or should you do the same session or the same content for everyone? Or should you tailor it and customize it? So as an example, um, I'm going to give, um, I don't know, let's think about like customer service, for example. Often I think of customer service, they're working at a desk or a computer, they're, maybe they're interacting with customers in person or on the phone. Um, phone might be a handheld phone. These days it's a lot more uh, computer phone, so maybe there's a little less handheld holding of the phone. Um, there's probably some basic ergonomic principles that I think would uh, you know, so that's one group of people, right? So we've got like our office staff or customer service people in that same organization. Uh, maybe you have your housekeeping staff as well. So custodial or janitorial type work where they're not at a, at a computer at all. You know, they're mopping, they're wiping, they're vacuuming, uh, they're sweeping. These types of things are also, you know, we need to address those from an ergonomic perspective, but they look very different than computers. So there are going to be some basic ergonomic principles that I think you that they're going to be constants, right? That's going to be your foundation or your your standard, your base in your training. Uh, the principles that everyone will benefit from learning, right? Talking about your program and talking about what are the injuries, and then the specific examples that you would use and the strategies that you use in your training to really make that hit home for them um, are likely going to be different. So, you know, you may or may not want to deliver the exact same session to your customer service staff as your custodial staff, for example, right? Your customer service staff are used to being on a computer, your janitorial staff are not. So should we even do them both as computer sessions, right? So, um, and making it relevant, right? Is it, you don't want to, you know, nobody wants to have their time, feel like their time is wasted, for example. So. If you're going to talk to me about computer ergonomics and I do not work at a computer, my eyes instantly glaze over 
and I'm not interested. And, you know, and I've, I've kind of, I've lost, almost I've lost, I've lost a little bit of trust in the presenter. Like you brought me here for that. <laughs> That's not relevant to me. So it's just to be mindful about that. And I'm going to talk about lots of strategies on how um, you might deliver training to all of those different groups, right? But the the big thing, so when I deliver training, when pro ergonomics, when we deliver training, it's always about answering this question. How does ergonomics apply to me? So how will ergonomics help me to do my job better, to do my job safer? What is it about ergonomics that will help me? And it's that what's in it for me, what's in it for you type of question and to really think about your audience. So for this reason, I'm strongly suggesting that you consider your training sessions to be focused on the different types of frontline staff you have and then have it customized to their specific needs. So again, you can have that core foundation of content, uh, but maybe you deliver it in different formats or maybe everybody gets it in the same format and then it's kind of the more customized section, the customized um, bit, like the phase two that we do a little bit differently. So let's first talk about that solid foundation, sort of like the what should be in your your foundation training, that standardized component, right? So ideally, if you are talking about ergonomics awareness training, um, this one on one, the basics, sort of like giving them the foundation, the building blocks for the next step is uh, teaching them uh, one. What is ergonomics? How to identify MSD hazards? should know what an MSD is as well. And then knowing some work methods that might increase risk. Flip side, work methods that might decrease injury risk. So things that can impact the injury risk from a positive or negative perspective. And then especially is thinking about ways that they can manage hazards that are within their control, right? This idea of working smarter, not harder. This is the empowerment of them, right? It's not just, you know, you need to wait for that million dollar piece of equipment or whichever, and then everything will be better. There's still lots that you can do, you know, that's within your own control. Um, we don't always want to focus on everything that's out of their control. We want to be able to focus on what's in their control so that they can make change. Uh, and it doesn't have to be like, definitely don't want anything like a blame game, for example. So um, my, this is like, honestly, almost always, and I might, um, Oh, I'm noticing that my words don't fit in my puzzle pieces. I don't know what that looks like for you, but they, it did fit in my puzzle pieces originally. But this slide or a version of this slide is very common to see in a presentation by us, right? We like to talk about what is ergonomics. And you know what? There are lengthy definitions for sure, right? Ergonomics is the science of how humans interact with their system at work, at home, at play. The system is the tasks they do the tools and equipment they use, the environment they're in. And I would totally break that down. But like, we don't really like to see big dictionary definitions, um, but breaking it down to, to understand that ergonomics is about how you, the human, the person, interacts with your work and all elements of your work. So the physical things that you use, the place, the environment that you work in, uh, how you do things, the work method, all of those, and then um, ultimately how you interact with them with the goal of reducing injury risk, right? The strains and sprains type of injuries. And then the side benefits, you know, we can improve performance, we can increase productivity and efficiency. You, you'll you feel better, you'll feel more comfortable, right? Uh, again, remembering ways that uh, bring it back to them, right? Like, oh, it's gonna save the company thousands of dollars or, you know, some people don't care about that. Some of your frontline staff don't care about that. They wanna know what's in it for them. So again, tailoring that. Um, but ergonomics really fitting the work to the worker. I find that it is the most effective short explanation and it is easy to um, use this sentence to be able to explain how does it apply to me, right? So each of each person, we're a different height, size, shape, and we may be asked to use the exact same tools or use the exact same chair, work at the same workbench or desk. It's not practical nor is it ethical <laughs> to suggest that only people who are five foot two work at the assembly line and people who are six foot two work at the packaging table, for example. Uh, instead, we need to look for ways to adjust or make modifications to the system, right? To the equipment, the tools, the layout to enable workers or people of varying sizes to do the same job tasks using that same equipment, right? And you can then, you know, use examples. So for example, if you are working at a computer, 
the this would be adjusting everything to fit you adjust the chair to fit you adjust the monitor raise it up to your eye height as opposed to hunched over your laptop right you're sacrificing your body you're putting it in a bad posture um, to work at the computer. You should be moving the computer. The computer doesn't have feelings. <laughs> you shouldn't have to work in an uncomfortable posture. You should be able to move all of that stuff to fit you. Same, you're driving, you're using heavy equipment. You should be able to make adjustments to that equipment. Um, you're working in a warehouse. There's equipment that you can use. There's, there's lift devices. There's different strategies that you can use to be able to make the work work for you as opposed to you sacrificing your body. So there's I find that this definition is the best. It's the most applicable. Uh, when somebody doesn't know what ergonomics is, then I might start with, well, what is it that you do? And then I sort of explain how ergonomics might work um, with respect to whatever their job is, right? If they tell me they work in a lab, then I said, oh, well, like in a, in a lab, we would be talking about, you know, your reach distances and your layouts and how frequent you're using, um, you know, the best position for the microscope so that you know you don't end up with a sore neck at the end of the day. So got to include this because again, I just did a training session last week and my opening question was like, OK, like what did you guys think that we were going to learn about today? Uh, you know, a session on ergonomics and the first comment was, well, what's ergonomics? <laughs> so it's perfect. It, there's always there's always one or two, right? That we need to, you know, and it's good. Let's just clear the air and and give that definition. Um, similarly, we also want to talk about, well, you know, ergonomics is fitting the work to the worker. Why? Because we're trying to prevent or reduce the risk of MSDs. MSDs are musculoskeletal disorders. Um, and again, today being RSI, International RSI Awareness Day, you might also hear them called as RSI, repetitive strain injury. Um, I've also heard like work-related MSD or work-related RSI. Uh, same thing. It's we're talking about the same like umbrella or this category of injuries. These are strains and sprains. They are soft tissue injuries. They are chronic um, and then they happen on a continuum, right? So we want to make sure that we are identifying or, or educating um, the staff on what that continuum is that it, you know, that that nag, that nag in your shoulder. It doesn't mean that we have an MSD. But we don't want to ignore that, right? Um, if something kind of is recurring and it keeps coming back and, you know, like, oh, I just my wrist hurts because I work on the computer and that's just how it is. Well, no, like if your wrist hurts, we should try to make a change or if your back hurts or your neck hurts, we want to make a change. We want to hear about it, right? Because if it progresses and again, you can kind of explain that progressive might start with stiffness or tightness or a little bit of discomfort. Um, but the longer that it lasts, discomfort can increase. So now maybe you're taking an Advil here or there and that's helping to relieve it. Or you're going for a massage or chiropractor and, and you know, and that's helping to relieve it, but it still keeps coming back, right? Uh, once we get to actual diagnosis terms, you know, like your carpal tunnels or your tennis elbows, usually that discomfort has progressed now to a description of pain uh, or tingling, numbness. Maybe it's affecting your sleep. Uh, home and personal life activities usually are affected and that's on honestly unfortunately that is when we hear a lot about um, we hear a lot of injuries being reported so I do think it's important uh, if you've got an injury reporting system in place at your at your workplace is making sure that you highlight how MSDs fall into that right is that considered a near miss is that um, like an awareness so making sure they know about the progression and when to report how to report um, because again, we need to we need to know early so that it doesn't progress, right? MSDs are soft tissues. They're they're treatable, they're healable, um, and they can take years to develop. But if we let them take years to develop, it takes longer to heal. So definitely, this is a good opportunity for a reminder on your reporting system. And we can talk about MSD hazards as well, um, like. OK, so your hazards are probably going to vary, obviously, with different frontline staff. But when it comes to ergonomics, we still have what we call the big three, right? Force, posture, and repetition, right? These hazards to a certain degree are found in most job tasks, right? We can use those and we can probably, we can find them. We can find them anywhere when we look at them, right? So force might be represented as pushing, pulling, lifting, or carrying, even forceful gripping. Um, postures we see awkward postures so you know something out of non-neutral so you know when asking how does it uh, how does 
how does our body respond when we're in an awkward posture, right? You know, you're trying to lift something and you're in an awkward posture, or what does it feel like when you've been hunched over your computer all day? Uh, you know, it really is not great for blood flow, right? So these are our, our common MSD hazards are force, posture, and then repetition. And we can kind of like, I often want to talk about repetition. I do often talk about duration or static postures as well. Um, Right, what would be the effect of static postures? So of not moving. So repetition in, in some ways isn't isn't really a bad thing, right? Moving is good. Our muscles like to move, but static posture and not moving it can in many ways be almost more harmful. So I usually like to touch on um, the static and the repetition and, and talk about repetition because I, I think it's a good one to review like the definition of repetition just because many people will say they're or feel that their job is repetitive and they're totally valid in thinking that. We don't wanna say that, you know, um, just because you don't do the same task over and over every minute doesn't mean your job isn't repetitive. Um, and, but I mean, it definitely is considered repetitive if you do do the same task over and over, like an assembly line, for example. You know, you might pump out a car every, every 60 seconds, for example. So the same tasks are happening every 60 seconds by somebody on the line. And I don't think we're going to argue that that's repetitive for sure. But we also don't want to argue with somebody who does something. Maybe it's every day they're doing sort of the same things, right? There's still an element of repetition there. And so what I try to focus on um, is not necessarily because I mean, like that definition of repetition can go on and on. But I really like to focus on how these hazards act in combination. So if you do something that, uh, if you do tasks that are considered forceful, right? I would ask questions like, so tell me, so again, we're talking, we'll use this janitorial, this housekeeping example. Give me an example of something that you do that would be considered force, right? If I'm talking about lifting or pushing or pulling, you know, what do you do that's sort of considered quote unquote heavy? And they'll give me some examples and and then we might talk about, OK, and like, why is it heavy or how does it make you feel? And and we we do. We talk a lot about um, identifying hazards, sort of like I almost call this like the complaining section. <laughs> Tell me everything that's like wrong about your job, um, obviously with a little bit of a, a positive spin. And and I will take that into more of an injury prevention piece. But it's a way that you can get them talking about their job. Again, we've got this core content, the standardized MSD hazards, but then talking with the staff, the frontline staff, the group that you're talking to and getting them to um, to getting them to describe how it's applicable to them. What are some what are some tasks that you do where you you feel like you're in an awkward posture or really doesn't feel comfortable? Uh, give me an example of something that you do that's repetitive. Give me an example of something that you do that um, where you like maybe sit still or stand still or you know you've got to hold something for a long period of time where you don't get a lot of movement right and and uh and sort of where i was going that in, in terms of like not focusing on the repetition is focusing about on how those interact right because the hazard really is in the combination of all of those so if you do do something forceful can you make a change can you make it lighter um can you change your posture right so can you reduce the force can you change your posture to make your posture better can you change how often you do it? So can you do it less, um, less frequently um, to minimize that combination? Um, and so that's really what, that's the part that's like within your control, right? And, it, and it'll help to answer that, how does ergonomics apply to me and give them, um, again, that empowerment. So I don't want to just talk about all of the complaints necessarily, totally get that. Um, but we want to help them to be able to identify. It's like it's like that first step, right? The first step is always identification or that awareness piece. Um, so what is ergonomics? How will it help me? And then you want to consider your training to be focused on the different types of frontline staff that you have, customize it to their specific needs. And again, kind of use um, these elements that I've just talked about to. To um, <laughs> sorry to um, make it relevant to them, make it engaging. OK, so the first portion of the training is sort of about identifying hazards, but now we need to talk about what to do about them. Again, we've sort of talked about this. I call it like the the complaining. And if but if you just end it there, then it ends with, oh, my gosh, I do all of these things and I'm at risk of an injury. And, you know, we it ends a little bit, but that's not a good way to end it. 
So you always want to make sure that you're following up those discussions with some injury prevention strategies, whether you're talking about um, work methods or something else like different types of equipment that they can use. Maybe your session turns into like maybe it kind of morphs into how to use this new piece of equipment, right? Maybe that was the goal of your training. Maybe it's because we're going to show a new work method technique and we're going to talk about um, manual material handling techniques or safe lifting techniques. But I do feel like this is the part of the training that will really vary the most when it comes to um, the different frontline staff, right? The, depending on the hazards that they're exposed to. The work methods, the controls are all going to vary greatly depending on the task, the environment. Um, so I want to talk more about how to customize this aspect of the training. And we want to be able to empower our employees, right? Teach them what they have control over to change. It's not just about waiting for that magic bullet piece of equipment. There is lots that you can do sort of in the now, in the present. Um, and so, you know, in general, I like to think of this, this outline to stick with that core principles followed by workplace specific examples always. So what is ergonomics? What are MSDs? What are some MSD hazards? And then what are some work methods that I can do in my job to reduce my injury risk? Or what other controls can I use? And I'm thinking about your groups. So what is the best way for them to receive training? What would be the most applicable for them? both from like the practicality aspect of delivering the content, right? Because if it's you delivering the training, what makes the most sense for you? Um, but then also for a, from that relevancy perspective. So the person receiving the information, what is going to be the best ways to get them to engage and latch on and, and actually take that training and use it? Um, and how much time can you get them for, right? Like how much content do you have to deliver and how, you know, is it something that you can get them for 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, right? These are all these factors, right? So it's possible that some content, like some of those theoretical components, uh, maybe that could be delivered online or self-guided. It's a pretty common route for training these days, right? Uh, especially after the past couple of years where we've had, uh, we've had to resort to more virtual we haven't been able to do in person. Um, you know, if I'm talking about office ergonomics training or setting up your computer workstation, like I do think that a virtual option or an online or a self guided option is not a terrible idea. It's definitely an option we could consider. What about if we're talking about safe manual material handling though, like lifting techniques? Is that the most effective method? So, um, you know, with all the training that is done online, it is important to kind of think about how to make it different too. Like I know we're definitely big on in-person training for sure, but I will say that over the past couple of years, we've been forced to think about different ways, you know, yourselves too, you've been forced to do training in different ways. The training still needs to happen. The education, relaying that information to staff still needs to happen, but we couldn't be face to face. And so we've been forced to think outside the box. Um, the tricky part really is that we do a lot of things online now. And so sometimes there's some value in getting away from the computer. Right? A, a big, um, you know, a classroom session might work for some topics, but it might not be practical for another session, right? So just some things to think about and maybe you break it up too, right? Uh, I've definitely seen that. So how can we break it up and have, um, you know, again, maybe you could sort of have that theoretical content in a classroom type setting or you could have it online. And then when we talk about the, well, how does that really apply to me in what I do, that sort of part two or that phase two, then maybe that's where we're going to the specific workplace, right? We're going out on the shop floor. And really, what is best practice for frontline staff training? I love this. I love this discussion. Actually, I I love asking this question. I love talking about this. I love hearing different ideas. Um, we've done some workshops in the past, but I would love to hear even like just just right now. Just even just think about um, think about a really good training session that you've been to. Whether on any topic, literally anything, whether it was like an old university class or college class that you went to, a professor, um, a seminar, a workshop, a conference, what was something about that session that made it memorable? What did like it was good? Well, what made it good? Like, what's one thing? I think that sometimes it's easy, and you guys can type it in the chat if you want to let me know, <laughs> and we can. It's like our way of like having a little chat, but. But I do, I do find this really interesting, right? Because it is so common to say, okay, we need to do some training. I'll put together a slide deck, put together some notes. Interactive sessions, right? So I see some of you typing in. So interactive sessions, instructor enthusiasm, for sure. I mean, I definitely know lots of things that 
that I don't like, right? Like I can't stand when people read a slide deck, <laughs> like when they write all of the words on the slide and then read it to me. I was like, well, I could have done that. <laughs> Real life examples, combined hands-on and open-ended questions. Absolutely. Um, I like hands-on for sure. And sometimes it depends on the, the topic too, right? So if it's something that's sort of a new concept and problem solving, like I like to do hands-on. If I have to learn about a new piece of equipment, I want to do it. Um, if I I do, I've done in the past, especially a lot of training with like nursing staff, for example. And if I'm talking about how to use a lift, like a, a ceiling lift to move a patient, I want to do it. Like get me in there. <laughs> I want to feel what it's like to be the patient. And uh, and then I'll know, like I'll, I'll, I'll just remember it. If I do it, I'll remember it. So there's definitely some topics that I think do really well. Um, with that hands on component, almost always with a hands on component, right? You think about different like adult learning principles and stuff too. Right now, like if we were talking about. Um, I don't know what's a good example here, like vehicle ergonomics training. Let's talk about that. So I'm going to teach you about vehicle ergonomics training. The reality is, is that if I'm going to go out to the, the vehicle, like it's hard for us to all get in it at the same time. So a one on one training might be ideal, right? You think about it. I'm like, OK, I could teach you how to adjust your vehicle and it would be really smooth if we just kind of met one on one, you know, for 10 or 15 minutes. I could walk you through your equipment. Boom. But probably not the most practical. Maybe if you have a small workforce, but uh, think about, you know, even having 50 staff, 300 staff, how are you possibly going to spend all of that time getting through all 50 or 300 staff in a one on one setting? Right, so probably not the most practical. Yes, might be the most effective, like, and maybe that's kind of what we want to strive towards, but we need to, sometimes we need to modify it to get it. Yes, open discussion. I love open discussion ones too. I find that when you do workshop type settings um, that the frontline staff, like as much as they maybe already work together, when you put them in that setting and you start asking questions and they work together, they sort of help solve the problems themselves, right? They start watching each other and oh, I didn't know you did it like that. And then it becomes like this um, like sharing opportunity. OK, so let's talk about some ways that you might customize your ergonomics training beyond those general principles, right? So some strategies on how you might um, how you might deliver this, right? So we might be talking about well, well, first let's talk about how you might deliver that sort of basic ergonomics awareness content, right? Think about those principles. Um, you want to think about. Like if you have an MSD, I say if if you have an MSD prevention program or an ergonomics program, hopefully you do, <laughs> but it should outline that training is required like that is that's part of your health and safety program anyways, right? That we're going to educate. But we need to remember new employees and also current employees. So new employees, it's usually there's an orientation day, right? So factoring in you know, something about ergonomics into an orientation is a great way to get your new people. So whether it's a in-person session because that's how you're doing your orientation or it's a webinar, like a live webinar, sort of like we're, what we're doing right now, or maybe it's a pre-recorded session. You know, there's a couple of different options on ways that you can kind of check off for your new employees. Sometimes it's your current employees that are harder because they're already been here. It's we, maybe we don't always have a way of getting them all into um, the same room, right? So how are we going to address that? Um, again, you could consider live webinars. You could consider an online module, self-guided, small groups on the shop floor. Uh, I know some some places have tried to do train the trainer as well. So um, trying to spread or distribute the load, right? So if you're one person, you can't possibly do it all, um, but you can have that content. Uh, if you do a train the trainer and you know we work on proper training of training the trainer and giving them the speaker's notes and you know coaching them through it, it can be a good way to have that information spread out. Again, if you have like multiple sites, maybe you're responsible for like a national company or provincial or several sites within the GTA. 
um, annual education days, wellness days, all of those are opportunities and maybe you hit up all of them. <laughs> like again, depending on the size of your organization, maybe we do, we try to do these uh, workshop, small group on the floor type of sessions, um, but we can't hit everybody. Maybe some people were off on holidays or you know, we've got different shifts and we just didn't get 100% of the people, then maybe they'll also, maybe they'll get it kind of in this next try on our annual education day or wellness day. Um, when it comes to that uh, phase two or the part two, this is the part that I always, this is the part that is, uh, that is, that's fun. This is the part that I find more fun to deliver to. It's the part that, that is, it's, it's, it was interactive. Um, we did hands on, you had real life examples. So let's talk, I want to use sort of, I'm going to use the janitorial or the housekeeping one just as my top example right here um, to kind of walk through. So once they get all the what's my company's program and what are MSDs and how does ergonomics apply to me and what are some of the hazards and how do I report them, right? We'll call that like the theoretical, like the base, the foundation. The next part is, well, how do I actually do ergonomics to, uh, how do I make it apply to me? So in janitorial or housekeeping, let's think about some of the things that can cause injuries. So lifting of mop buckets can be heavy. The repetitive action of mopping the postures that are associated with mopping or sweeping or vacuuming, um, the reaches that happen when you're wiping surfaces, whether they be like tables and counters or mirrors and walls, right? Vertical surfaces. Um, so we've, again, we've identified all of these hazards and it's like, how would you do them safer? So can we reduce the force? Can we improve the postures? So would we put everybody in a classroom and talk about that? I mean, you could. Um, I would say that it's probably not the best. And we've actually had some really good success. And it's one of my actual favorite. Um, it's one of my absolute favorite sessions to deliver, actually, because we do it in a workshop type setting. And so you kind of depend on the you kind of break it and modify it based on the group size. So let's say you had 20 people that were coming to the training session and you were able to have, you know, at least two different trainers. You could break your group up. You could break them up into groups of two or three and set up little stations. So it's one of my favorite ways, again, is these little stations and station one might talk about mopping and station two might talk about lifting when it comes to like emptying the garbage bags and station three might talk about lifting, but more like heavier or larger objects like um, moving tables or chairs, right? If you're having to set up a boardroom for a meeting. And then station four could be about wiping surfaces and then we kind of go through some problem solving on what are the tools that we have available? How can we interact with those tools better, right? Like, so a good example for mopping, right? If you read anything about the ergonomics of mopping, it'll talk about how you should dance with the mop or do the figure eight method um, or keep your hands staggered at the top, right? And, you know, you could probably recite them, right? You've read them and you're like, yeah, yeah, okay, that makes sense. No, but go and do it. Go and do mopping and actually make sure that you're doing those. And that's what we would do in a workshop is you know, people at frontline staff, they've been mopping for years. And I'm not saying that they're that they're not good at it, but maybe they maybe maybe there's room for improvement. So when you're dancing, this is the nice part about video here is that I can actually show you is when you're dancing with the mop, you should actually be moving your feet. It doesn't have to be as much shoulder. And you'll probably find that a lot of people, especially if they've been doing it for a long time, and that shoulders will be a complaint and they probably move their shoulders a lot and they probably don't move their feet nearly as much as they think. And so I find that that's a really fun one. You know, and you can ask questions too, like how how tall should your mop handle be? How tall, how tall should the mop handle be uh, in terms of proper ergonomics? Right, and so you can put like little quizzes in there um, and get them talking. And you might find that some people will be like, oh, I don't know. And some people will be like, oh, mine's this. I always I always choose the mop handle that's like this, or uh, I cut it down so that it's, it's this height for me. And it should be, it should be between like your chin and your nose, because if it's much longer than that, um, it just, it adds so much extra swinging. Um, and if it's too short, it adds a lot of extra bending. So there are like ideal mop handles, but then getting them to talk about it and practice it, it makes it so much more fun. Um, I'll use my nursing example again. If you are teaching somebody on how to use a lift device, the best thing that you can do is act it out. So in that case, like if I was doing a training session with nursing, I would double check your policy. So if it requires a minimum of two people to operate the lift, then I want to have a session with 
at least two, um, at least three people probably. I want somebody to be the patient, and then I want the two caregivers or the two nurses to actually operate it. And I mean, as the trainer, I can hop in there as well if we're short a body, but preferably, it's nice when they can wrote and then everybody can try it. They can try being the patient, they can try being the nurse and feel what it's like to do the equipment. And, and those are the ways that you make ergonomics training fun. It doesn't have to be ergonomics training. Honestly, you can take this to anything, but you know, think about Think about the training sessions that you like, that you've liked. Think about the things that you don't like. And then, um, so I say this, <laughs> I say this is like, oh, it's no problem. Just like go out there and do it. And I know that there's some practical challenges, right? Of making that happen. Um, so if we're only gonna do small groups of like three or four nurses and we need them to get in the lifts, like how are we gonna actually get them there? Um, I find the janitor housekeeping one isn't as challenging, right? There's, there's usually a day, like an annual education day, for example. And you can sort of reenact that, right? We don't have to go to, we don't have to go out onto the floor or out into the, out onto the front line really to, to do this training. We can bring that equipment to a boardroom or to a training room and we can reenact mopping as long as we have a floor, right? And not carpet. Um, the nursing one, maybe we could too. Like maybe we could sort of reenact it. We could bring a stretcher if we've got like a training room. Again, trying to bring that equipment to the location uh, going there is always better but if you can bring it to you just really trying to reenact it um, i really like small group workshop training um, for hands-on now it's not to say that it always has to be that way but it, it definitely i think is some of the more effective training but the the main things really to keep in mind is that you're making it relevant right you're making it practical there's nothing worse than saying we're going to talk about safe lifting training and you're sitting in a classroom and the people that you're trying to teach have there's nothing that they actually lift here we're going to talk about okay we're going to talk about safe lifting training and we're going to lift these boxes and they're like we never lift boxes in a day and instantly you sort of lose credibility their eyes glaze over they're not interested because you don't really know what they do um so whenever possible, going out to the environment, I think, is helpful. And if you can't go out to the environment, then try to recreate the environment and bring it to you. So we've done a lot of man manual material handling training with, um, so for example, with public work staff in municipal settings. And sometimes we're doing it in the winter. So going outside is cold or it's snowy or it's you know not as practical, but we can get them to bring their trucks close, bring them into the shop. Um, bring them into like a bay and do the training in there. You know, you sort of adapt to make sure that it is practical and like, and it's worth it because people will remember those sessions. They're like, oh, that was different. Yeah, well, I've had lifting training before, but not like this. Oh, that was good. <laughs> um, so you want to make it relevant. Same with, if you're going to talk about vehicle or driving ergonomics, use their actual work vehicles. Um, Jen and I just did this session actually last week. So we were working like at an aggregates facility and um, we had the shop bay and they brought their equipment in. So they were able to bring it into the shop and park it. And in our small groups, I think we each had four or five people at a time and we would go, but we'd hop between each vehicle and we would talk about, you know, how can you adjust this equipment and entry and exit into the vehicles and how to adjust it and, you know, how ergonomics applies to them. Totally made it work. It was definitely a bit chilly, <laughs> but we totally made it work. Um, Computer workstation ergonomics, again, I, this is one where I did mention earlier that I do think it's one that you probably could do, you know, a self-guided or a virtual, and we often try to do this one as self-guided or virtual, right, where, where we give them, we give somebody like, here's how to set up your computer workstation, um, but how could you make that more practical? Um, I like asking questions i like saying okay you want to check that you're at elbow height now here do this do this check and then ask them a question if you were going to do it live um, if you weren't doing it live then you'd want to make sure that you are giving opportunity for maybe you're pausing and there's like an engagement piece where they answer a question but you know what i find works really well for for this even if you do it, whether it's recorded or live um, if you do follow up assessments or you do some sort of a follow up, so people will pay more attention because they know you're going to follow up with them. Um, so they'll pay more attention. I mean, in general, people will pay more attention if they're feeling discomfort, right? Because they're they're wanting that. But in terms of that proactive piece, if you're wanting them to make change, um, I just find that people will pay attention more in the session if they know that you're going to meet with them afterwards. Meeting could be virtual. 
could be a phone call. Um, it could be like a, a video meeting. Um, it could be meeting in person, right? Depending on where you are or if you've, you know, sometimes even having a third party, right, is, is kind of what makes it interesting. But knowing that they have to sort of answer to somebody and just say like, okay, so you watched the webinar and you made some changes to your workstation. What did you change and what's still left? And I just find that they'll listen. Uh, they'll listen and make change a little bit. More. They're more likely to anyways. So that's sort of my my uh, in a nutshell of the training. So I, I think if I were to kind of recap it and break it down, um, it's thinking about what is your goal? So what's the topic or what is it that you're trying to convey, right? To make sure that you are thinking about your audience and the location and the delivery, making sure that it's not too much, right? Um, you know, half a day training session, full day training sessions, those can be exhausting. Can you break it up into smaller chunks? Um, because we're talking or focusing today on ergonomics awareness, I do often break it down into like a phase one and a phase two. So like a phase one or a part one being that general overview, that background, um, where it's sort of that standardized content that can be given to everybody. And then you can ask questions, right, to get them thinking about how it applies to them. But then that phase two is usually more of the how does it apply to me and making sure that we are really making that relevant to them, their tasks, their work environment, right? So considering the setting that you're hosting that session in, um, you really want to get maximum engagement and interaction. So again, making it relevant to them, right? Using their actual work, uh, work stuff. And then, and it, I'll sort of say this as well as like maybe you maybe you don't know how to use it all and you can learn, <laughs> but you also don't necessarily need to because you can get them to show you a lot as well, right? You can get the frontline staff to do it. You need to be there to sort of cue or facilitate the session. Um, and the more you do it, the more, more you'll learn. Um, but you're just thinking about ways that you can, you know, in this day and age, we're just getting there's it's so much training, right? So you want to be you want to be the one that stands out, um, you know, and 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 be a little bit different. So um, next next steps, that's it. So think about what training that you've got on the go. Um, we deliver training. We've got lots of different things. I'm going to tell you a little bit about something that is coming up new in 2022. Uh, programics, um, the last two years have really forced us to think outside of the box, but we have a really exciting launch happening in 2022. I don't want to give more details on the date just yet, but I will tell you that it's called Pro OLS. So it's an online learning system. Uh, so I like hands on. I like workshops. I do think that that's sort of a, a gold standard in terms of some content, but I also think there's lots of content that could also be delivered online. And I think that it can be made fun and interesting and engaging. And if you guys know Pro Ergonomics, you know that we are always trying to do our best and to stand out and quality is key. So we have been working really diligently on this new product um, and we even have a new tab on our website. So if we, there's not any content on there yet in terms of like um, the sessions that we're going to have. We are still in the process of actually uploading that to kind of match our look for the website. But you will see, you know, on the tabs across our website where we have like, you know, about us and services and contact us. Um, there's a new tab for Pro OLS. So you'll have to watch out for that. Um, and not to worry, we will also be very sure to let you know when this launches. Um, you'll hear about it via email, you hear about it via social media. We're gonna be talking about it lots. So stay tuned for that. Uh, we will have another webinar. We are back to regular monthly webinars. Our next webinar, I unfortunately, I don't have the topic yet. I'm working on a description, but I do know that it is going to be March 29th, 2022. Isn't that kind of crazy to say? Uh, it'll be at 11 o'clock and uh, we're coming up with our description right now. So you will see that on the website this week. And then we will also send out some email reminders for that as well. So awesome. Thank you guys so much for attending. It was great to be back in the webinar world here. Um, if anybody has any questions, I am going to hang out online. You can shoot me a message in the chat there. Um, but I thank you so much for attending and supporting Pro Ergonomics. And tell your friends. <laughs> Come to the next webinar. Give us a follow on social media.
and uh, we will hopefully see you again soon. It is nice to be back into this world of uh, sort of quote unquote regular consulting where we're going on site a lot more. You're so welcome. <laughs>